Now in its third year, it's a yank on the footy with Craig Wessels talking about the greatest game on the face of the earth. Sit back and enjoy, everybody. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 125 of A Yank on the Footy. I'm Craig Wessels coming to you from Sandusky, Ohio. In this episode, I had the great opportunity to interview two people involved with the D.C. Eagles who won the Division II Nationals in Austin, Texas here in 2021, as well as with my youngest guest to date. All three of them are part of one of the most unique footy programs going on here in the United States. We also tossed around some really interesting ideas on how to get the game of footy in front of the huge population of sports fans here in North America, something that has quite frankly been a goal of this podcast is to try to get more people interested in this game. Now, today's club of the episode is the Sturt Double Blues of the SANFL. The Double Blues were established in 1901 to coincide with the Sturt Cricket Club, and some of the alum that have played with Sturt that are now part of the AFL include Chad Wingard, Bertie Grundy, and Callum Coleman-Jones. They're going to be getting started here very soon. In fact, the senior men play a practice match coming up on March the 5th against Norwood, and I want to wish best of luck to the Double Blues as we go forward in 2022. Now, ladies and gents, before we jump into the episode, uh, I wanted to reach out. If you happen to be a fan of the Swans or the Eagles or the Tigers, the Lions or the Suns, I'd love the opportunity to talk to you about your club in 2022. I've got pretty much every other club lined up with at least one guest to talk about their club. But if you're interested, head over to my website, ayankonthefooty.com, and click on the Register as a Guest button. You can also send me uh, a DM or a message on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. Love to set something up and talk to you. And don't forget that you can find everything related to the podcast over at my website, ayankonthefooty.com. I hope you'll consider checking that out. You can leave a voicemail there. You can share your views on an issue from a previous round. You can ask a question that you'd like me to answer. You can also sign up for the mailing list there as well. And if you want to help out the show, you can click on that little yellow button in the bottom left-hand corner. That's the Buy Me a Coffee page if you like what I'm doing and you want to help keep it going. would certainly appreciate it. And those of you who have already, I cannot thank you enough. And also, if you're interested uh, in the podcast and any kind of the gear, you can head over to my Redbubble page, and that would be fantastic. So let's dive into the episode, folks. I think you're going to like this one. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This morning, I am pleased to be joined by a current and former, but still somewhat active member of the reigning USAFL premieres, the DC Eagles. I'm joined by Seth Sternberg and John Watts. And I'm also joined by a special guest who is going to talk about uh, their love of footy as well. And that is John's daughter, Zoe. And I'd like to welcome all three of you to the podcast. Thanks for coming on this morning. Um, Thanks for having us, Craig. Thanks. It's great to be here. Just yep, uh, one, one, one quick clarification. Uh, the DC Eagles are the Division II men's premiers. Right, right. Yes. Oh, yes, I know. I know. Too, right? What's oh, that? I can. The women were in the grand final, right? No, they were not. Oh, okay. No, the women finished uh, third. Oh, okay. okay. Yep. They're very good. Yes, they are very good. <laughs> Yeah, I think I spoke to uh, somebody from the that won the D, the Division One, I, I believe, um, not too long ago. But uh, gentlemen and Zoe, thanks for taking time out of your morning here today, and was uh, you know wanting to to talk to you about the the DC Eagles. But uh, Zoe, I wanted to take a little bit of time this morning to talk to you about your love of the game of footy. Sorry, poor timing. That's okay. So, so Zoe, you you are. Can you tell us uh, how old you are? I'm seven years old. You're, you're seven. I'm, like, I'm gonna be eight. Okay, fantastic. You're gonna be you're gonna be eight here very soon. And a couple of years ago, your dad introduced you to Oskick, correct? Okay, so. What what do you think about footy? Um, I, I like it very much. I think it's pretty good. Um, I am, and 
um, this, um, if I like it, my dad likes it because, yeah. What do you like most about? I, I mostly like tackling and bumps and handballs and kicks. What did you okay. think when we went to our first session? What was the first thing you thought about playing? Uh, football. Yeah, but what did you think about it? Did you enjoy running around? Did yes, I, I, I mostly like running around and getting, getting my energy out. Okay. Because I, was probably, because I was probably six when I first started it. Okay, yeah, because your dad said that you are involved in a number of other things as well, and we'll talk about oh, those. In, yeah, we'll talk about those in a minute. But uh, as far as as far as footy, when you first got the chance to do it, were you were you excited about it? Was this was this something that you really really enjoyed, or was it something that he kind of had to talk you into doing? <laughs> I really enjoyed it. He didn't have to talk me into it. Um, it's just, I don't remember how it got started, but he did not have to um, talk me through it. Okay, okay. So when you go out on Saturday mornings and you're participating in this, is it, is it something that, that kind of happens maybe after the the eagles get done pl- pl- they, they get done having their practices and then the the younger people show up and then they help to train them no i don't think so okay okay but i, I but you've had that that program's been going on for several years now actually probably since about the time you were born if you're 7 yeah so i mean the, i think in the early days they did try try that it, it often comes down to logistics of, of which parks and, and grounds we can rent and play and stuff. So we're going to look at ways to, uh, to reintegrate the kids uh, program in with the Eagles, but it's just, you know, it depends on when the, the, the adults games playing, where they're playing, are they playing at home, are they playing away and those sorts of things, whereas the kids need to be a little bit more uh, kind of routine and structured and, and in certain areas that are close to where the, the base of support is. Um, it's obviously part of the, the, to travel with the kids and, and have a big group participate but um it's something we have done in the past and there certainly was a number of eagles players come out and 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 help train often before their game and then they go on to their game uh and it's something that we're going to look for you know other ways this year for us to um do some extra training sessions on the side of some of the eagles games okay there's been a a lot of integration over the years as, as john said so you know when when we could arrange uh fields and permits that that fit everything then yeah, we would, what we would typically do is start with the kids program and have uh, Eagles players come down early to help coach and, and run the, the kids program. Uh, and then we would move into uh, often a Metro game uh, and invite any of the older kids from the kids program to join us, or at least for a little bit of training, mm-hmm. uh, if not the full game uh, afterwards to kind of, to, you know, really kind of strengthen that pipeline uh, to give any of the kids that are interested a chance to, to watch the adults play. Uh, now that the there's there's kind of been a bit of a more of a separation because of the fields and permits and logistics, uh, but still, when the kids program is running, we try to schedule our training or games later in the day. Okay. So that we can still have people come out and support. We've 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 made a, a concerted effort to make sure we can support that. Okay. And we've done some things in the past. We tried uh, a couple of years ago. We had a a mixed AFLX game. So we took some of the, the older kids uh, from the program, the 15 and 16 year olds and mixed them in with some of the Eagles players. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, so we're, 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 we're looking for ways to, to make that integration stronger and, and really build that pipeline. Because we've had several players come uh, into the Eagles from the kids program and been- I was gonna successful. ask you that. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, t- that's fantastic. Yeah. That, that's great that you're able to, to kind of build that from within. And that's a, that's a, a great you know, resource for the longevity and the success of, of the club, but also just in terms of the connectivity between, you know, family members and such. And, and some of these younger people, are they, are some of them kids, you know, young people who are not necessarily associated with other family members of the Eagles who have heard about it from elsewhere and have discovered it that way? Yeah, I mean, this uh, this year I actually had a, a colleague of mine uh, come up to me um, during this you know during the season. I saw him out at a work function. He's like, "Oh, have you heard of this Australian 
football training thing. I'm like, yeah, I'm coaching it. Why? He's like, oh, my my partner found it online, and apparently they, his, his kids or his partner's kids were in my group. I didn't even know it. So yeah, I mean, there has been um, been some of that. And you know, in terms of that transition to the, the adults, there's a really there's a difficult kind of valley of death, I think, with um, with the kids stuff. You know, under 12s, it's fairly easy to do interesting, rewarding stuff with the kids they, they they really enjoy but unless you have a really big group of um or a big community it's hard for them to, to for the you know 12 to 15 to 16 year olds to play a proper game of footy when you have you, know, you need 18 a side so you need a minimum of 36 kids mm-hmm. of the same age group to play i mean i i didn't play uh, football in high school because my high school was too small to field its own football team we had to combine year levels together to get a football team whereas soccer was much easier with only you know 11 or 12 people on the team um, actually, all, all the way through my high schools, uh, my my schooling in Australia, my schools were too small to fill the team. So we had to combine with other other classes or other schools. So that's really hard here, where there's not necessarily yet a, a big community of it, and that's something we need really need to grow. So that's where that that um, the metro stuff is really important because in those younger or mid mid teenagers, you know, 14, 15, 16 year olds can come and play with the adults without it being too threatening or risky or you know. Um, uh, you know, too intimidating because they're not going to enjoy playing against the kids, but there's not enough of them to play against each other. So right. that, that gap between 12 to 16 is, is a really big challenge and one that we're going to have to kind of work out a better way of, of fixing. AFLX is a great way because it's a smaller team or a smaller group. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's an option. Um, but that's, that's definitely a, a challenge for the future we need to think through. I mean, the first step is to grow the young kids playing, but as they progress, um, you know, we, we really need to figure that out, how we bridge them between the kids' programs and the adult programs to keep feeding them into that system. Now, Zoe, have you have you been able to recruit any of your friends? Have you told any of your friends about OSKIC and have brought them to the trainings and that sort of thing? No, I don't think so. I don't, probably not. I, I, we haven't been talking about that. We, um, because we have to focus on a second grade class, um, because it's really busy and stuff. And in spring, we've got to move to third grade. So we're trying to like balance it out. So maybe I'll tell them at recess time, but for now we have, but when, when we're inside the building, we have to focus on our math strategies and stuff. Right, so right told anyone yet um so so that answer is no i haven't told anyone so we, we, she did have some of her um some of her other friends you know kids that she went to daycare with before school and stuff who you know friends with on on social medias and they saw us talking about it there was some interest from a number of them i actually went and bought a whole bunch of extra footies and, and tried to set up some kind of informal sessions um i've invited a couple of my buddies and their kids to come along to it uh, so that's something on me is that I need to set up more kind of informal sessions and, and more things like the Sunday kick along where we can get more of the kids involved. But we've done some in the street, haven't we? We've got the kids, all the kids in the street came over to our house. Yeah, and... like Melody, Noah, mm-hmm. and John's come out tonight. Yeah, so we've, we've got all the kids, you know, we've got a number of young families in the street. So we've done that. We've just gone out in the front yard and, and I've had a bunch of extra balls and we've all had a, had a bit of a kick around. But... but one of my friends is a little bit older than me. Um, but he plays soccer, not football. Okay. <laughs> so have you, would, would you be allowed to take a footy with you to school and take it outside for recess? Would that be something they'd allow you to do I without the tackle? I don't think so, but they do have balls, but not footy balls. Just like the little, the little spiky kind. Mm-hmm. But but no footballs there. I don't think they would probably allow me to do that. I mean, they would probably take the ball away from me. Um, so I don't think that's possible. Okay. And the other thing that we've um, we've been uh, talking about, Seth and I have been talking about recently, is you know a lot of the, the moment the Oz Keep program is kind of based out of Northern Virginia, which is on the you know southern side of Washington DC, and has really great community base there. Seth and I both live on the north side of DC and we've been talking about how to kind of grow out the community on that side of the city as well. Uh, and so again, that that probably come from some of the, you know, some informal kick around sessions and those kinds of things a bit closer to us and try and grow kind of little, you know, little clusters of, of football support around the city uh, more. So uh, that's, that's another task for next year. 
Sounds good. Sounds good. So Zoe, you, your dad said that you were also involved in a couple of other things, and then we'll probably jump back in with your dad and with Seth here. But he said that you are also into racing, which is not something that I hear a whole lot of seven-year-olds being involved with. Yes. Um, yes, I do go racing. Um, What's yours? Uh, I race in a go-kart. And I've won two first trophies, a couple of seconds, and a little bit of thirds. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I just one third, mostly, mostly seconds. So, so you were saying that, that you've, you've won some first and some third place trophies, but a lot of second place trophies as well. Yes, and I also have some very good racing friends like Cole, Sarah, Levi, Connor, his brother, I think, Hunter. and Hunter. And I'm, today we're going to go to Hunter's house and check out his cart mm -hmm. to see if I would want it or not. Yeah, so we're looking at upgrading the cart for the next season. So, um, yeah, we've, we've done a full season now. Um, all her kind of racing exploits are on, on her YouTube, which is where a lot of football videos uh, are put up as well, just because we haven't got a, uh, an Auskick uh, video set up yet. Um, but, uh, yeah, she's, she's really enjoyed that. Um, what's, your, what's your favorite part of our racing? What are you enjoying most? You like racing with your friends, yeah. Okay, and you you just like your your dad said before we started recording. He said that you were, I think he referred to you as an adrenaline junkie, somebody who just likes going fast. Yeah, is that is that accurate? Um, no, I don't think that's accurate. And I think, <laughs> um, and I do not think those are the right words to describe. I do like going fast. I do I do like. I'm racing with my friends, but 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 I do I absolutely <laughs> like going fast, and that is not the right word for it, Mister. Okay. You're thrill seeker. She likes the thrill. Well, well, that's probably a discussion that the two of you should have <laughs> a little bit later on. Okay. <laughs> so, is it okay if I jump back into talking with your dad and with Seth now? Okay. okay. Anyway, Zoe. brother wants me because he because about the whole call he's been screaming for. Me. Okay. Ah! Well, thank you, thank you very much, Zoe. Thank you very much. All right. So that was great. It was great to get her insight on uh, on on Auskick, and and uh, I, I love hearing how it's growing and how you guys are are working at at trying to build your your opportunities for a player base from basically from the ground up. I think that's fantastic. Um, and, it, and it makes sense. You know, when you talked about how the, you know, that the, that the club kind of originated from people working at the embassy there, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, Seth, let me jump back over to, to you. It, you know, you, you are, you're an American who discovered this game as many people did seeing it back on ESPN many, many years ago. What was it that uh, actually uh, that drew you to the game here? What made you decide that, you know, okay, I've seen it. Now I want to go ahead and give it a go. So you know, this was many years ago, and, and I've never been, you know, anyone's world-class athlete. And I really got into playing sports kind of later in life, you know, basically picking up intramurals in college and, and from beyond that. And never really did much before that. Uh, so, you know, I, I tend to, to look towards sports that, you know, maybe are a little bit more niche in this area so that I can, frankly, have a little bit more of an impact, right? I know if I go try to play pickup basketball, you know, however good I may think I am, I'm not going to have, you know, <laughs> I'm just not going to match what's out there. I haven't been playing it my whole life. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to find something that, that no one's been playing their whole life. So have a little bit more of a of, a, of an even starter, um, and uh, I had been playing a, a fair bit of roller hockey, um, and then the the league I was in folded, so okay. I was looking for for something to replace that. And at the time, and and this is this is kind of interesting, uh, the company I worked for was working on building DVR software, to and uh, I was in quality assurance, so part of my job was to record and watch various 
things on TV to make sure the software was working all right. And I needed, you know, long content, short content, all sorts of recurring content, all sorts of different things. And one of the things I would regularly record and test with was the AFL game of the week. Okay. So, so when my roller hockey league folded and I started thinking, well, you know, what else can I do? I was just kind of poking around on the internet. I had no clue there was a, a team in the area. I was just interested in AFL and was poking around and, and Google happened to return behold. the DC Eagle at the time, the Baltimore Washington Eagles. Yeah. So, you know, I looked into that a little bit and they had um, uh, what they called Ozball, which was, which was basically an adult non-contact version of footy. Uh, so I started playing that for uh, about a year. Uh, and then when the, uh, the interest in that wasn't enough to sustain it anymore, I said, well, I can you know, give it up and go find something else, or I can make the leap to full tackle, which okay. I, had, I had never played a full tackle sport before in my life. So I was a little bit terrified, but I went out and I, I gave it a go and been playing for the last 13 years, I think. Wow. So, yeah. And, and you're one of the longest, like tenured members of the club, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, continuously been... tenured. We, we do have a few people okay. that, that kind of, you know, will, will come in and out on occasion that have been around longer. But yeah, 13 years. That's a, uh, that's impressive. What, what, what's the most dinged up that you have been from playing? <laughs> if I may ask, uh, I have been incredibly lucky. Uh, over the years and and you know i've never <laughs> i nothing wrong with that yeah i've been i've been pretty lucky and i you know maybe i've only missed a handful of games to injury you know okay mostly that's good you know, maybe you know tweak an ankle or something but I, i've been really lucky <laughs> so you know i i i have to ask you guys here real quickly my my wife uh she and I, and this is something I've not probably, I know I've never shared on the podcast before, but she, she used to work in DC before we got married. She was, she taught at a, uh, a, a preschool that was actually run by the white house. Um, before, uh, we, we were one of the, you know, we actually met online. We've been married now for 26 years as of last week. Uh, but, uh, I have to tell you, how do you guys deal with the traffic? I just, I, 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 my, my son, my son is an officer in the Navy. He's stationed in Norfolk and I went down to visit him in, at Thanksgiving time and had planned out my route to take I-95 through Richmond and completely avoid DC. But I stopped and got gas and went to use the bathroom and my phone decided to reroute me unbeknownst to me and took me right through the beltway. And it's just, it's, how do you deal with that? So um, I, I have uh, learned over the, the years to somewhat suppress some of my cultural tendencies as an Australian. Um, when I am on the Beltway, the uh, cruder elements of that come back in, in full force. <laughs> and uh, I will have, uh, you know, if, if you're sitting in the car with me, you'll probably hear some creative use of certain words mm -hmm. in ways you never thought possible uh, within the English language. But no, it, it's... Yeah, it, it's terrible. It, it really is terrible. I mean, I've been lucky in that um, I've been able to at least send me remote work for really four or five years. So, you know, long before the pandemic, I was already kind of only going to the city a couple of days a week. Um, I'm currently uh, having to work out in Northern Virginia a couple of days a week, and, and that is, is pretty terrible. But, you know, I mean, you, you kind of just accept that it's going to take you an hour to get literally anywhere for anything yeah. uh, at, at a minimum. Uh, and then if it's if it's half that, then it's a bonus. So I think at a certain point you just become kind of inured to it. Uh, but yeah, it's it's terrible. Yeah, uh, it really it really impacts the the quality of life probably more than anything else in in uh, in the city. Um, and not just because of the amount of time taken in it, because some of the driving, you know, it you've, you've got literally drive. You know, one of the problems with DC, I think people appreciate, is you have at a minimum drivers with at least 50 different driving cultures, right, from every different state in the US. Oh, good um, point, got, good point. You've got three main states kind of right next to each other, but you've got people from all over the state. But then it's also a very, um, you know, global metropolis in, in terms of you have a lot of um, people, not just the, that are diplomats, but also um, people working for NGOs, working for the World Bank. 
So you've got, and, and that's before you have, you know, immigrants who have moved here from other countries. So you've got, got literally hundreds of driving cultures where, you know, s- slightly different, you know, ways of thinking or doing things. There's one thing where like people turn on their hazards while they're moving. I still don't know what that is, but I see it. I've seen it enough times that it's, it's not a fluke. It's not a coincidence. <laughs> it's something that, that it comes from some state in America where that must be the, the local law or, or pattern or what they do. I don't know where, and I don't know why. And they think that they're trying to communicate something rationally to everyone else. That's what they've always done. Right. No idea what the message is. I know they're trying to message me. I don't know what the message is. Uh, and then you've got that from literally all over the world. And, you know, if you've ever in Atlanta, like Atlanta is insane. I mean, that is like Mad Max, you know, like I remember I've driven through there a couple of times and like the first time I drove in and we're driving down the in on the ramp onto one of the freeways and a guy came down, I was driving, you know, 40, 50 mile an hour. A guy blew past me on the safety strip and then cannonballed across three lanes through busy traffic at peak hour wow. without missing a beat and no one blinked no yeah. one had a, you know, there was no no beat there was no cursing it was just but everyone does it so everyone's used to it and everyone expects it the mm-hmm. problem in dc is half the drivers are more cautious than you are and half of them are more insane than you are and you never know what you're going to come up to and so it's an extremely uh intense mental activity you can never relax because you never know the style of driving of those around you and every, you know, you've got a mix of so many different types. So not only are people bad drivers, not only are there is, is the infrastructure overloaded and over capacity, but you've also got all these different people who are going about it in different ways. And it just makes it a very stressful uh, experience. <laughs> it, ne- it never, do- it, it makes complete sense, but it never dawned on me about the, uh, the different driving styles from all over the country and all over the world that, that it, that's, it's, it's, plain is as clear as the nose on your face but if you're not looking at it you just i just wow i never even thought about that but that makes such such complete sense then to make a tenuous uh, segue back to the football i mean uh, it's, it's also a real strength for us right because you have people who who are going to be here not just americans but but also internationally who have an interest and appetite for new things and learning other cultures and those sorts of things so you not only get you know, the, uh, a large transient population of Australia. I think the Australian embassy in DC is the second largest in the world. Um, so, you, and, and again, you don't just have the diplomats, you have the military exchange officers and you have the trade officials and, and you know, whatever else. There's also mm-hmm. a very big Australian expat community. I can't throw a stone in downtown DC without hitting Australia. Every organization I've been to has had, you know, a, you know, a, a, a token Australian somewhere in the organization. Um, you know, World Bank, uh, the, the head of the IMF was Australian for a long time, I think still is actually, I think Australian, the, the IMF head of security, you know, the head of security at the IMF was an Australian and handed off to another Australian. Um, you know, so, the, you know, there is a big expat community here. And so that helps both with the Eagles and with the, the kids programming, although it means that it, it can be fairly um, hard to build longevity because people post in for a couple of years and you get some rock star AFL player who comes in and is amazing for a couple of years and then posts out again, and you lose your, you know, you, you, you're starting center half forward or something. Uh-huh. Um, but, you know, so that's, that's where the Eagles will probably have more flux than say a Colorado or a Texas where people move there permanently and stay there long periods of time. In, in DC, there's always people coming and going. I didn't expect to be here as long as I have been. Um, but then the, the, the flip side is not only do you have the ex- Australian expat community, you have, you know, French diplomat, uh, you know, an, an Israeli who are, here wanting to experience new things and so they they take the opportunities to not just experience american culture but to experience you know again that 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 um cosmopolitan um you know way of things in dc and so you, you know you're going to attract a lot of different communities so there's great opportunity but there's there's you know it's just it's a unique characteristic to the city okay so you know we're we're we're, we're definitely jumping around in this which i have no problem with because i mean it's just some fascinating subject matter here um I do want to jump back down to the to the to the Nationals, Seth. And you, you were you were at the Nationals this year, correct? Uh, unfortunately, I personally was not. You were not. Um, okay. No, I had a. Okay. Had, uh, so, okay. So so we were planning a family event years in advance. Okay. I said, all right, Nationals is always the first or second week of October. Third mm-hmm. week of October, we should be good. All right, we'll be fine by then. Not a problem. Then of course the pandemic hits and changes everything. Yeah. And it's still changing <laughs> it's things. It's still yes. changing everything. Uh, and so for the, the 2021 nationals, or even, even then originally plan A was to hold it in LA the second week of October. 
And plan B was to have it in Austin the third week of October. And sure enough, we ended up going with plan B. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you, you lay out your plans, you think you're going to be good. And then I ended up not making it. And this was, let me tell you, this was a bad year not to go to nationals. Yes. Yes. It was, uh, so, uh, you said you'd done some work with, with, uh, um, DVRs and that sort of thing. How are you with Photoshop and Photoshopping your picture into the, <laughs> your photo into the, into the picture to say you were there? Uh, I'm not so good. <laughs> others, others have handled that for me, actually. Okay. <laughs> so so, so I, I have been Photoshopped into, into more than a few of the, of the pictures from National. <laughs> so it had, it had to be a, a, a great, you know, a great thing for the, 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 players on the club who were able to make the trip there that had to be extraordinarily rewarding and when they got back and I'm sure you guys had one heck of a celebration as a result of that yeah so you know one of the things that that we've that makes me most proud about the club as a whole and and that we really have put work and effort into is just how inclusive and welcoming it is so you know when when everybody was on the field after the, the premiership win and, and celebrating and, you know, just going nuts and when they were, you know, passing the cup around and everybody getting drinking out of it, you know, first of all, it, it was club wide, right? It was, mm -hmm. we had, we had everyone, the, the women's team, the reserves team, all our supporters were included in that completely. And that what really touched me is while you're in the midst of, you know, this great celebration, the, the coach, and one of our captains had the presence of mind to actually call me and call a couple of our other players who weren't able to make it to nationals. Okay. And just kind of pass the phone around in front of the celebration to let us Very cool. be a part of it as well. Very cool. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's fantastic. So have you left your plans open for October next year? Yes. No conflict. Okay. Okay. I already, I already have the dates on the calendar. It's, it hasn't been made official yet by the league, but I've already got them blocked out. There you go. I, I think as well, you know, again, the, the, the context of the win is what gives it, you know, so much more meaning as well. So as an ex-player who, you know, hasn't been involved for the last couple of years and left kind of as the, the club was starting an uptick, but saw a lot of the, the kind of darker days that the club had had where, um, you know, it was, again, transient population, you get waves of generational players that kind of come and go and where, you know, five or six years ago, we could barely field a team between DC and Baltimore combined and, you know, didn't have a ground to play on and, and, and those sorts of things. Um, and then, you know, after the split, the first couple of years, DC took a little while to get on its feet. Um, you know, we, I remember the, the last couple of games I played, you know, the Dockers just wiped the floor with us. I remember, you know, and, and New York, you know, a couple of years ago, were just completely in, you know, indomitable i mean they they, they have such a, a big australian expat community up there and and you know they're a really strong football program and you know you'd kind of go into the games just assuming that you're going to lose just wondering how, you know whether you can put up a, a fair fight or not mm -hmm. um to to then see this team be back into the div two i mean i remember when i first joined the team you know 2011 or 22 there was a real big debate about whether you know, we should accept sliding the Div 3 or Div 4 because we had always traditionally been a Div 1 or a Div, team, Div 2 team. And, you know, was that, you know, were we accepting mediocrity and accepting defeat? And, and you know, um, would, would that harm the culture of the club by letting us slide down the ladder, you know, uh, you know, a couple of grades to be more competitive against equal teams? That was a very real debate, I think, in the early 2010s um, that I recall. And, and there was a lot of different views on it. And then from there, you know, it really has been, it was down for a number of years to see the team come back and really be underrated. I remember there was a, there was a tweet um, going into the nationals where someone was talking about like the strongest teams in, in DC, you know, in, in the US or the US AFL. And, you know, they talked about the Dockers, they talked about New York. And to that point in the season, this season, I think the Eagles were either undefeated or close to undefeated and had one of the regionals, a beat Dockers beat New York. And I was kind of like, you know, I said to them, you know, on, on Twitter, like, you know, where's the love for DC? I mean, you know, they've been, you know, almost unbeatable. This right, season. right. Um, why aren't they getting the recognition? But, you know, DC had fallen out of that psyche. You know, you always know that Austin's going to be strong. You always know Denver's going to be strong. You always know New York's going to be strong. Eagles used to be in that strata, in that sphere where people would talk about them as always being one of those strong teams. And the last couple of years, 
they kind of fall into irrele irrelevancy in some regards. Um, and so to see them come out and be as strong as they are and, and have the season they have, and, and frankly, you know, that's not a fluke. It's not a, it's not a one-off. It's not just a couple of players came to the city. I've seen this from a distance, the culture and the growth and the strength. I mean, part of when I would kind of come in and out of the team was, you know, I was too busy or, or, or you know, had other priorities where I, I, I couldn't train regularly. And I didn't feel like I should come in and take someone else's spot when they'd been at training all the time and those sorts of things. But I'd often turn up just because I knew they weren't going to have numbers mm -hmm. and, and not because I wanted to, to get a free game, but because I didn't want them to turn up and have to borrow players off other right, teams. Right. Now, I'd, I'd been that because I was never that good, frankly, or never that athletic. I've, I've played a lot of games. I think I kicked more goals for the, uh, for the um, North Carolina Tigers than I have the Eagles, actually, um, because they played me forward one game. Um, you know, so we used to lend out players to other teams. We got to a point where we would have to borrow players of other teams just to play mm -hmm. a game. And I didn't want to see the Eagles beat that. And so I would randomly turn up and just throw on a jersey just so you had the numbers on the field. That's where we were in, in the middle of the last decade. Um, so to see that now, where I wouldn't, I'd be struggling to get a game in the seconds because there's so many players and so much quality there. Um, it's just incredible. And, and the win's great. It's always nice to get a piece of hardware. But what really powerful is it just what that symbolizes in terms of the way that club has has strengthened and grown and expanded in recent years. And I think that's the real story of it. Okay. That's great. That's uh, it, it. And it's, 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 it's wonderful to see the resilience because as you said, it was, they were really scuffling and I, and you know, and, I, and I've not spoken to anybody from the New York Magpies before, but I've, I've heard that their numbers are significantly huge in terms of, so I, I've wondered just in terms of, of having, you know, like built in opponents, have they, and I've asked this to other people on the podcast, I said, have they ever thought about having borough specific clubs? You know, maybe, maybe you have a Manhattan and a, and a Brooklyn and, you know, and a, you know, a, a Bronx or whatever the case may be, you know, um, are, is there enough, you know, spread out throughout those different boroughs for them to be able to do that sort of thing? Probably. I mean, it's what those, I don't know. Um, I mean, I can't remember the number. There's 10 or 100,000 or something Australians expats split around the country. And there's, there's a large concentration in Colorado because of the mining. Mm -hmm. um, there's large concentration in Texas. Um, but there's a very large concentration in New York. I mean, aside from the football, just Australian expat demographics. Um, there was a point a few years ago, I don't know if it still was, but they were calling Northern Little Italy, Little, Little, Little Australia because there was just so many expat Australians living in a mm. you know, five or six block area. I mean, there's tons of restaurants up there for Australians, number of businesses out of there. Um, you know, there are various patches of, of really strong expat Australian communities. And that's always going to going to help when you've got guys who, have, you know, played it since high school, cradle to grave or whatever. Um, and then that, you know, I, I think these sort of things, they create gravity, right? Or, or like once you have a strong core, you pull others in because other people see that it's fun and exciting right, as a right. group. But it's exponential when it starts falling apart and it's not fun and there's only a couple of guys, no one wants to come out because it's not worth the effort or you're not going to enjoy it. And so you need that really core, hardcore group. And, and this is where people like Seth are so important to this is they've kept that going, they've kept that passion going. And when you just start getting a little bit of growth, then one more person's like, oh, well, I wasn't going to bother, but lots of people are going out. I want to be a part of it. And you just, that then starts growing on itself. And again, it, it builds a gravity, it pulls in more people. And that's where the Eagles are at is it's now in that, that circle where it has a gravity, it can pull in people that might not otherwise think about it, might not otherwise know about it um or, or just you know care about it but weren't going to make the effort well and and you know you mentioned about you know seth's seth's role in this and and mm -hmm. and, and and it's evident that that's the case because I, I i did see where recently he had been actually given an award for you know being like one of the outstanding administrators now is that for the entire usafl yeah that was for the entire usafl was, okay yeah that was okay that, that was actually one of the the pictures i was photoshopped into because uh the award is given <laughs> at nationals. So our, our head coach went up and, and received it on my behalf. And so they just okay put my face on his uh body okay. to accept, to accept yeah. the award. It's 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 uh it's kind of interesting because uh the, the person that it's named for, uh he he and I were actually born on the same day. <laughs> so Paul Ruse and I are both uh we were both born on the same day in 1963, a long time ago. Um so yeah, that that's so, John, you are in you're an Adelaide native and you've got your Crows T-shirt on right now. And you and uh, Zoe still has her 
her poster somewhere, whether it's hanging on the wall or not, we don't know. Um, you know, you grew up a, a Crows supporter once the, the Crows came around, but you were also a, a Sturt supporter in the Sandful. And, uh, and I, yeah, I was, and I, I've heard of them before. Do they, and I saw where they referred to, they re, actually refer to them as the double blues. Is that correct? Yeah. So um, the, the history of the club, as I understand, so they, I mean, they, they, you know, the, the club or the ground is, you know, a couple of blocks up the road from where I grew up. Um, and my family is kind of split on my side of the family is all Sturt supporters. And then a lot of the kind of extended family are, are Nord supporters. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I grew up, you know, obviously in the eighties uh, and they were, they were very strong back then. They, they had a number of, of premierships that are a strong team. You know, I remember um, in, uh, in primary school, my, uh, my nemesis, or, you know, the, the kid that I was always, um, you know, button heads with was a, was a Port Adelaide supporter and a Magpie supporter. And, and that, you know, kind of rivalry between Port and other teams is very real. And, and that was always a, a course of a, a, a point of friction, but um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I've always used the number 10 and that's partly uh, because my favorite player growing up was John Painter from Sturt. Um, my, my family's, you know, like I said, my, my grandma's house is, is a block away. My grandfather was part of the bowls club that backed up onto the Sturt Oval. Um, there's actually the Sturt, the Dog Blues have got um, around the, the posts around the field have all got little. Um, so as I was saying, so the, you know, the Sturt Oval and the Oval has white picket fences all around. There's a little engraved, you know, sponsored <laughs> things. And, and my family have got multiple pickets around that, that ground. Um, so, you know, and, and, you know, my, my extended family all kind of go there. Uh, regularly and, and the, the history of double blues is that they are on oxford and cambridge street and oxford and cambridge universities are light blue and dark blue respectively and so they came to be known as as the double blues because that was the colors they adopted as a team uh, and then you know so i i you know i grew up a uh, sturt supporter crows came into the league when i was probably about 10 or 11 and that was obviously a, a huge excitement they won their two premierships in 97 and 98 when i was 17 and 18 respectively um and you know there was a lot of excitement about that at the time, I mean, that was a huge thing for, for Adelaide to have an AFL team. And that was right in my formative years. So, uh, yeah, I've been a, a, a Crow eater, a Crow fan uh, for life. And my, I mean, my, my following of it has kind of waxed away a little bit. So I, after I finished college or finished university, I moved to, uh, to Darwin for a year and then to Canberra. And those are non-AFL states or not heavy AFL states. Uh, and it was hard to get coverage of it back then on free air. So I would only get to see a couple of Crows games you know, two or three times a year, they weren't a big Victorian club, they wouldn't get a lot of coverage. And so I just lost contact with it for a number of years. Um, and then, you know, moving to the US. Uh, but as kind of the streaming options have, have increased the social media, I've been able to kind of re-engage. And now I watch every game, I can actually get better coverage. Now I'll, I'll, I'll be tweeting out about a preseason game that people in Australia can't watch because it's not free to air, but I get it on the streaming service. I probably get better coverage now than I would in Australia. Uh, and, and for me, it's, it's a bridge back right, home, it's right. a connection back to, to my home country and, and to my family and friends back there and, and, and growing up. And so I actually wasn't a big sports fan growing up. I used to hate the, the uh, stereotype that, that men had to kind of obsess about sports. Uh, and I was always into international relations, international politics. But as I've got older and, and um, more cynical about the world, sometimes I just like to switch off and, and, and watch the, you know, watch games, watch people kick balls around and, and run into each other and hit each other. So um, it's, you know, sport generally has been something I've got more into later in life. Um, but but re-engaging football has been really, really important for me. Well, I, I cannot imagine living in the DC area and not being just a slight bit cynical. Um, I, I, I think that is, don't they actually, you know, like in some places they put fluoride in the water. Don't they actually just like add cynicism into the water there as well? <laughs> yeah. Well, I always, I always joke that I, I think I'm, I'm, um, either too cynical or not cynical enough for the city, because if I was less cynical, if I was more naive and idealistic, then I'd be happier because I just blindly believe whatever, you know, idealistic goal I'm going for, or if I was more cynical, I wouldn't care about just how bad or, or mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is. So I'm, so I'm in that unhappy middle ground where I'm cynical enough to realize the idealism is, is, you know, is a, is a wasted energy, but not yet cynical enough to care, to not care that, that it's a wasted energy. And so I'm sort of in the in that purgatory between. 
So what what brought you to DC, if I may ask? I know what you said for work, but you know, can can, can we can we tap touch on that at all? Right. Yeah. So yeah. So I actually um, my my wife is American in California. I first came to DC in two thousand four as an intern through the uh, University of California internship program. I spent three months there, and that's where I met my my now wife. Um, so we we lived and worked here for a little bit in in college days. Um, in Australia, I worked for the Australian Department of Defense. I had an opportunity to come over here. Uh, my, my now wife had moved to Canberra for a couple of years with me, um, and we were looking to come back to the US. Uh, there was a company here, a uh, consulting company that did work in the defense space, uh, and they were looking to expand and looking to bring in more Australians because they're an Australian company or an Australian-owned company. Uh, and so it just kind of lined up perfectly. So I came over and worked for them. Um, currently, I work for a, a foreign policy think tank in DC, uh, although I'm on secondment to the Pentagon for a couple of years. Um, but, you know, in that, that government space and in that national security, international relations, foreign policy type space, I mean, it's ground, DC's ground zero for that. So a little bit of family, a little bit of personal, a little bit of work. Okay. That's, that's I mean, that that's a whole different avenue of discussion that I, I'm sure would be, you know, extraordinarily fascinating, but I'm sure a lot of it you're not even able to, to get into, which is, uh, which is completely okay. So Seth, you know, you, you, you've come to the game you know, as a, uh, as an adult, having seen it through ESPN, you've been watching it, uh, you've been participate, participating in it now for the last 13 or so years. Have, have you got an, an AFL club that you support or are you a free agent? Uh, you got to pick someone, right? Everyone's got to pick someone. You get, you get about, you get about a, about a year, maybe years grace. Uh, in most cases, before you got to make a decision. So uh, somehow I ended up with the Saints. Uh, okay, okay. You know, haven't haven't run into too many other Saints supporters around, but there are a few. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. I I'm I am a I'm a cat supporter, so it's uh, uh and I'm deathly allergic to cats. <laughs> so there's I'm not sure how I ended up with that, but I just well, actually I do kind of know, but it's it's you know it's it's a long roundabout story, but I. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I started watching the game about six, seven years ago, um, where I started following it closely. Uh, but you know, it's it it is something that has just it's taken up all of my sports viewing time during the months that that the season is going on. I mean, I, I'm a huge baseball fan, and I actually just recently did an episode about how I think that the uh, um, that major league baseball is, is currently undergoing their version of self immolation. And I think they're destroying the game right now. Um, so I, I haven't watched, I haven't watched an inning of baseball in two years. Yeah. I mean, I, I've actually, you know, been getting less and less enamored with American sports over the years. I mean, I used to be, you know, just a, a diehard football fan and, you know, yeah, you know, the, the story of, uh, of Dan Snyder, who's a team that he, he's the owner of the Washington team, you mm -hmm. know, was that he grew up a fan and he even had the, the team belt buckle and all that. And, and that was me, right? That was me. As, I, I knew every player. I knew everything. Uh, you know, I would be, you know, a, a loss would ruin my week. Uh, and, you know, and, 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 you know, I was a, a Capitals fan, you know, Maryland Terrapins fan and, and just, and, and now I find that I'm just not as, into the American sports, the, the, you know, the, the concussions, the, the, you know, the, yeah. the, the greed, the, the lack of respect for the, the players and the fans, uh, you know, so, you know, I'll, I'll watch a little hockey here and there. I'll watch a little college basketball on occasion, but for the most part, you know, I, I find I'm not watching much of anything except the, uh, the occasional AFL game. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I've, I've been a, you know, I've been a Browns fan for, you know, my whole life. And, uh, that's why I had to ask, uh, I had to ask John there, the, the Jersey, it was hanging on the wall. I couldn't tell from the, the, the coloration, if it was a Steelers or a Packers Jersey, cause I was going to have similar emotions <laughs> about them, especially after last week, because, you know, but I, I, I'm, not a, I mean, I respect the Steelers organization, but I'm not a fan of theirs, but I, I, 
I absolutely loathe the the Ravens. I despise them. There's I just I I hate the I hate the Ravens. Okay, I'm just. Talking about resiliency, it doesn't like being a Browns fan has to be like one of the most resilient or require the greatest resiliencies in sports. Wasn't there a point a couple of years ago where like if you ask Google Maps where Sadness lived, it would take you give you directions to the Brown Stadium or something? Probably there's a there's a uh, uh, he's a comedian, but he also does some dabbling in journalism. A guy by the name of Mike Polk, who uh coined the he, he did a video and I'll, I'll send you guys a link to the video but he did he did a uh, a video after uh a, a browns loss about five years ago standing outside the stadium and he does a lot of things related to the browns where he coined the phrase factory of sadness um you know standing outside of the stadium and uh it, it's 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 one of the funniest things i've seen but it's also it it has it has rung so true and you know and they're getting you know, they're 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 becoming a respectable organization after you know stepping on their toes and you know stubbing their toes for the last 20 years since they came back into the league um uh, but you know it's uh <laughs> maybe you should have been like a, a gold coast or carlton supporter then it would have been a more uh familiar fan experience yeah. well i i i you know when i was doing the research to decide what club to support you know i i I was, I was, I kind of shied away from, you know, like the city center of Melbourne. I mean, cause I, I figured there were so many supporters in the, in of those clubs within the city. And I, and I had actually narrowed it down to, if I'm not mistaken, I'd narrowed it down to Geelong and to, um, to Brisbane and Brisbane was the one I almost there. went with. Um, and, and there was for a while I was considering Collingwood, um, only because, well, only because my my daughter's nickname is Magpie. That's what I've called her my whole life. So I, I almost went with with Collingwood. I'm I, I've met some fantastic people who are cat supporters, you know, and, and supporters of other clubs. And that's one of the one of the 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 things that I that I I love about this game is that you know I came to it so late in life that I don't have in my DNA that that hatred of another AFL club. I don't, I don't have that. Now, of course, you know, I don't have a problem with that, with the Ravens. We, we talked about that, but you know, I, I know I'm not supposed to like Hawthorne, but that's, I don't, I don't necessarily really feel that way. I mean, I, I want to see the cats win and then I want to watch eight other great games that weekend. So, I mean, that's what I'm hoping for. So my biggest beef with, uh, with the cats is the supporters. There used to be a, a supporter, like fan call that always go, Go G long, and it was just <laughs> so god awful and obnoxious uh-huh. in your ears. That when they play at Adelaide Oval or at Footy Park, and you you hear that, it just it was like nails on a chalkboard. That just that used to bug the hell out of me. Well, I had uh, it's funny you mention that, but I I, I my college roommate uh, he went on to be a, a graduate assistant coach at Youngstown State University here when Jim Tressel, who went on to become the head coach at Ohio State for about a dozen years, when Jim Tressel was the Youngstown State head coach, and they were a very successful team uh, at that level. And I went to watch uh, a playoff game there. And I'm sitting, and I'm sitting in the stands, my buddy got me seats for it. And there was a lady sitting behind me. I had no idea who she was. But every time, every time a uh, Youngstown State got a first down, she's she's ho- and she was in her 70s and she's hollering first and 10 do it again keep it going all the way and i'm and i'm thinking this lady's driving me absolutely nuts and i got at, the game is over and I, I i went back to my my buddy's apartment met him there after the game and i was telling him about this and he said he said that that's coach tressel's mom and and, <laughs> and uh and he said he said you had better seats than she did because you were sitting a row closer. He said, but yeah, because his his dad was a legendary, like small school college football coach for like thirty five years. So she had grown up watching you know college football for decades as a mom and that you know as a as a wife and such. So I was like, I was about to give a hard time to the to the the head coach's mom there. So I'm glad I didn't. But but yeah, I, I can certainly I can certainly empathize with you on that. So, um. I had just a few other questions for you. Um, 
Now, now, Seth, have you had a chance to go to Australia to watch any football in person yet? No, I've never been. I've never been. Okay. Are, is that on? Is that on your list of things to do someday? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And it's funny because you know when I when I first started playing footy, I was you know it was almost unheard of for someone to to come to the game without having been to Australia mm-hmm. or or having some connection. Right, right. Um, but now you know we've we've grown to the point, and there's been so much word of mouth that. Uh, we've got we've got lots of people that have never been and have no connection and it's you know it's been great you know the, one of the things about the the growth this year is that it's really been organic we've tried over the years lots of different ways of recruiting with you know some success um, but not not a lot uh, but then this year you know I think there was a lot of pent up demand to just get out and do anything good point and, you know, as we know, once you, once you try footy, you're hooked. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, word of mouth and, you know, friends of friends and the club grew just incredibly this year. So what, what do you wish Americans knew about the game? I just wish they knew it existed. Okay. They, they knew that it's, that it's, that it's available, uh-huh. right? That it is an option in the U S Right. You've got you got people that that are looking for for something different that are looking, uh, you know, maybe they've seen it on TV and, and appreciate it and said, well, that's crazy. But it would never occur to them that this might be happening in the U.S. Right. Right. Um, and, and just to know that that it really is a game for anyone. Right. You don't have to be the star athlete. and You don't have to be, you know, six, four in order to, to play and be successful. No, I did see somebody that was that size because uh, I had not seen any games in person until August of this year. And I went, I went down to the uh, regional tournament in Cincinnati and Columbus was there. Cincinnati was there. Uh, Nashville was there as well. And there were a bunch of players from Indianapolis that came in as well. And there was a, a young man from Nashville who I think, could go he could probably go play in the the vfl right now and i say that only because he's now playing in the nfl um he got he was he had play, he was a tight end at michigan state and actually mm-hmm. shortly after he played in this tournament and it was and he was playing rock he was he's a tight end he was about six five and just watching him just you know dropping kicks from from off on the wing about 50 meters out and just dropping them at the top of this, you know, the, 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 the goal square. And just, it, it was just, it was phenomenal to watch. And it was, uh, you know, it, it was, yeah, I'm, I was impressed by, you know, just how competitive, you know, the, the, the players were and just how the, how the camaraderie was between, you know, each of the clubs that were there. Cause like I said, I'd never, I'd never had the opportunity to, uh, to to see any of the games in person when i was there and i don't know if you've ever met uh wayne kraska before sure. okay yeah, absolutely. well wayne, wayne happened to be there and i and i talked to wayne a number of times online and um you know tried to you know do what i can to promote the forty five thousand goal that they mm-hmm. have well he happened to be there so i sat down and and just you know shot the breeze with him for the better part of about six or seven hours while he had his little storefront open up there as well. And I, and I wish I'd had, uh, I wish I'd had my recording equipment out to record all of that because it would have made some, some very fun discussions, but I'll hopefully sit down with him again in the future. But yeah, it's, yeah, just the fact that it, that we need to let people know that it's there would be a, a huge help. And I, um, how can we, how can we continue to promote it and not necessarily the USAFL, but even getting people to, to watch, the the AFL itself because if, if I'm not mistaken in Canada they do a pretty decent job of actually promoting the the Canadian clubs on television. I've talked to some people in in Canada who have said that they actually will have when they advertise and they they air games on TV there that they'll actually mention that that there are clubs that are playing the game within different parts of Canada. Yeah, I definitely think the AFL could do a better job of, of highlighting it, even just That's showing, like, sharing clips of it and those sorts of things. I mean, um, these days with social media and everything else, everything's so much easier than it used to be. I, I know of, uh, of, of race teams, amateur race teams, you know, just average guys going out and, and racing their cars who will hook up 
you know, a phone to a to a MiFi thing and, and stream to YouTube their ratings. These are just amateur guys doing it mm-hmm. for a couple hundred bucks. Um, these days, there's really no excuse for it not. And, and AFL would be foolish if they're not going to invest in in how big a market this is and with very little resources, very little effort, can take advantage of, of the ground soil that's already here and, and build that up and, and see it grow. So I think there's an appetite for it. I think um, Americans are, are naturally well predisposed to AFL because it has elements of, of all the different American sports um, that combines them in, in different ways that, you know, they might not like the stop-start nature of the NFL. They might not like, you know, um, the small fields of, of basketball, whatever it is, it, the AFL kind of combines so many of those different elements. And I think you've seen that with the growth of soccer right. in, in the U.S. in recent years, but it brings in a bit more of the physicality as well. Um, I think, it, you know, I think you know they, they, you know there, there's a natural audience there that just uh, yes you know needs to discover it or needs to be shown it or exposed to it. Yeah, I think uh, you know the, the AFL does support the USAFL, and uh, you know I we we spoke at nationals a few years ago uh, with a representative of the AFL, and the impression I got is that the the league as a whole hasn't really seen the return they're expecting on that investment. And so I think what we really need to do to, to, to build that is, is to have someone on the U.S. side develop a plan, you know, whether it's just a, a marketing plan or a growth plan or something to, to really show here's how we want to grow the game. Here's how we think we can grow your audience, not just our league. Right, right. Um, and that's and that's a that's a different, you know that I don't think that sits on the shoulders of the current USAFL board, right? Their job is is to grow our league, right, right, and grow our game, and not necessarily grow the AFL presence here. And so there's there's really no one who's who's taking that on, but I think it's necessary, and I think it'll it'll benefit everyone if we could do that. Yeah, I, I it's. To me, the, the the season for the for the for the men's competition, and even you could argue the women's competition, it fits so well into the time frame of, of let's say an NFL fan, because if you look at you look at the the women's comp is going to start next weekend. So first weekend, it was actually supposed to start a few weeks ago, but they they delayed it. But yeah, you got ten rounds there, and then you know the the three rounds of playoffs, and then the grand final. But the men's comp is starting, I think, third week of March, and then it's done by the end of September. You know, just a couple of weeks mm-hmm. into the NFL season. It's if so. If if you're an NFL fan, but you're not a baseball fan, this is to me this is a huge untapped opportunity. And and I, I've made the argument with with a number of people that I think they do a a pretty lousy job of of. Market now, now don't get me wrong, FS1 and FS2 have been great in terms of actually putting games on television, but they don't tell anybody about it. They're just they just show up. The game the games are on at 2:20 in the morning or five o'clock in the morning or whatever the case may be. But there's no there's never any little advertising crawl or anything like that that says, Hey, this game or this, you know, this this is happening at such and such a time. Set your DVRs. It's just like we were back in the 80s where, you know, AFL was just a filler for the late night slot at ESPN. Right, right, right. There's a lot of reasons I love the, the women's competition, but, but one of the big ones is exactly what you just said. It fills that gap, right? There used to be a gap from the end of, you know, from the Super Bowl through to like kind of mid-March when the AFL would start up. I had a whole month without football. Now I've got, you know, got mm-hmm. coverage year round right. between the NFL and the AFL. But, you know, as an example, I mean, the, um, the promo ad for the AFL a couple of years ago was, uh, was Believe. Uh, you know, the, the Believe ad with the song that had little clips of, of people playing. Zoe actually appeared in it um, in, in a split second part of, of the original one uh, just before the pandemic. Um, and it was from our Auskick program where she was, you know, doing a, a marks up on the bag. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, it was kind of cool from a personal point of view to see your child in a national advertising campaign, but where was the kind of recognition um, either at the AFL level in Australia or over here that like here was a clip of grassroots mm-hmm. AFL being played 
thing inserted into into and then there was like some other clips of some other really cool videos of, of people from overseas but no one would have known that was from the u.s right, came right. from washington dc um I, I think that was kind of a missed opportunity to kind of highlight the fact that it was um you know it was grassroots growth do you, do you remember a couple of years ago there was a, a north korean uh expert who was or a british guy but on an expert on north korea appeared on yep. bbc and his yep. kids came running in the background i actually had that i was doing an interview on sky a couple of years ago and zoe <laughs> snuck in and mando crawled behind me and then like jack in the box up into the picture uh but luckily for me they happened to be running b-roll footage at the, at the exact moment and so i never actually made like, a live coverage uh on sky in australia but um when i ended the interview and, and got offline the entire control room was in hysterics <laughs> laughing their asses off um but, and they're like we loved it. it was fantastic but yeah it was uh, uh, playing in my head was that, that well, that's what he went through in that in that case where i was like don't overreact don't yeah. completely ignore it because you're gonna it, end up it, as a viral meme it, it is yeah it is um, it is what it is i mean this is uh you know i i do try to i do you know make edits where there are little hiccups and that sort of thing but but stuff happens i mean this is not you know, this is not the, this is not the BBC. It's not uh, it's not Fox News. It's not CNN. This is not it's not it's not the most polished thing. There's only there's a little tarnish here and there. And that's OK. That's OK. Um, yeah, I just I, I just I and I, I've made the argument that even even if the AFL could figure out how to capture one percent, just one percent of Americans to be interested in the game in terms of following the game. That's 10% of Australia's population. If they could get just 1% of the population here and just you know, in terms of just, you know, how huge that could be in terms of buying merchandise, you know, I just, I just spent a hundred dollars on merchandise from the cat store just the other, just a couple of days ago, but you know, merchandise and, you know, maybe people even coming to travel to see games once we're allowed to travel. Okay. Also like advertising here is you know, to Seth's point about having a plan um, how you know how are we selling the, the advertisers? Who who would benefit from an interest? You know what American companies would benefit from a connection to an Australian sport, right? And then you go and you build mm-hmm. a marketing plan around that because um, that usually drives it. Because if you've got a, a company, who maybe an Australian company who's trying to you know build its profile in the US, for instance, um, having that that soft culture, that, that so that soft power, that cultural connection to something. Is going to be valuable and then you have an incentive to, to drive towards and you've got new advertising dollars coming in and those sorts of things so i think seth's right i, I think it, it requires an actual strategy and, and not just a like you know turn up and do good stuff and good things right. happen as a strategy i mean an actual like you know if a plus b equals c then what can you do to enhance d um that kind of thing there was, there was talk at one point i think some some guys from la wanted to buy the giants and we're trying to have a giants game over here once a year and I feel like the AFL in the past, when it's expansion, been I mean, fairly ad hoc, right? They've, they've played games in India, they've played games in China, played games in New Zealand, and a lot of them have kind of petered out for various reasons. I think part of it has been like the strategy has just been we just need to go and do it somewhere and get exposure for it, and then good things happen. There hasn't been a, a marketing plan or a business plan that says how do we connect this product to something that is of actually actual value to local marketers or local advertisers, and then using that to drive right. uh, yeah. drive interest. It's what are your thoughts on that, Seth? Yeah, I, I think you're right, John. I think it's you know you've, you've got to make it. You've you've got to tie it to something that 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 makes sense, and you've got to, um, you know, figure out how you're going to reach people. You know, I think that one of the one of the biggest problems is the time the games are on, right? If you're not already dedicated, you're not going to watch a game live. It's, right, right. People just aren't going to get up and do that. So, so we need to think of these other ways to do it. And whether it's having games over here, you know, I know, you know, this was several years ago, but, but, uh, you know, at one point, I think, uh, Sydney and was it Collingwood, uh, some it played a game out in, in LA, right. And it was just a, it was just a preseason game, but, you know, when I look at, at say the NFL, right. And the NFL made the decision, we're going to build our presence in Europe. And they started having those games in London, right? And basically force feeding it, right? No one in London cared about NFL, but you know we're gonna we're just gonna keep doing this until it becomes a presence, until it becomes expected, and and it's no longer 
um, mm -hmm. just a curiosity, right? And now they're hosting multiple games and the fan base is growing and people actually know what the NFL is over there. And so it may take something similar where you've just got to, you know, and, and maybe that involves the USAFL clubs. Maybe it's, you know, and, and of course I'd love this, but, you know, maybe it involves some promotion of our game to get people to understand that, that this is something that exists and this is something that, that you can be involved in even if you're not getting up at three in the morning. Right, right. Right, or traveling to Australia that, that you know, and, and, and maybe they can bring up, you know, some, some AFL preseason games, some AFLW preseason games over, you know, when there are those, those gaps in the American sports season, right, that, that, that fit perfectly. You know, or, you know, you, you, you've got to, you've got to make people aware that this product exists yeah. and how great it is. I think, I think I can, like, I've got some personal experiences, I think, on the reverse side, right? So, like, growing up in Australia, there wasn't a lot of baseball. And, and there's always been, like, little amateur leagues and stuff, but it's, you know, it's tried several times to kind of build up. But I got an interest in, in baseball in the 80s, uh, in, in the early 90s. Uh, because I was in Sydney visiting friends and there was a local college team had come out to play some games and they were practicing in the field next to us. And so as a 11 or 12 year old or something, I watched them play and I, I got kind of interested in it. But, but a big part of it was also the romanticism or the, the connection you get through, through pop culture, right? So like A League of Their Own, I love that movie. And, um, you know, I, I had never understood NFL. I, you know, I came to the game fairly late because it's a very technical game and it's hard to kind of get into, but I loved Any Given Sunday. Um, I became a Packers fan because uh, one of the first NFL games I got to watch was, and it was a Super Bowl, was it 95 or 96 when, when the Packers won? And I turned it on and it was being, it was playing at midday because of the time difference um, in Australia. And I was I don't know, 14 or 15 and the game was on. I didn't have school that day. Um, and I, I picked a team to go for, and they were in green and yellow. The, the Australian sporting colors are green and yellow. So I went, I'll go for that team. And then Brett Favre bombed it a couple of times. I went, <laughs> I like that guy. You know, but that's exposure. I mean, again, I, I grew up as a, a big Formula One fan. And part of that was I got to see it on free to air. Even as a dedicated AFL fan, when I lived in cities that didn't have on free to air, it wasn't easy to watch. I didn't watch it and I fell out of, of contact with it. Uh, when I got access to it again, um, I did. You know, um, Formula One, I've, I've been a diehard um, Formula One fan since I was five years old. But when I moved to the US, it was always on speed TV or some obscure channel and the coverage was terrible. And I lost track of it for years. Pre previously, I'd watched mm -hmm. every race for a decade, but I didn't watch it for multiple years because the coverage here was bad and it wasn't easy to get. Um, you make that easy to access and easy to find and people will find it. And then you see the resurgence of Formula One in the US is a large part of, of Netflix and the Netflix series Drive to Survive. Again, people have that connection. There's a romanticism to it. They see it in pop culture and they connect with it and watch it. So I think all those sorts of elements, it's, it's being able to access it. That's a really big part of it because as a casual fan, you have to be able to access it. The time difference is hard. Um, part of it is building up um, some of the, uh, the feeling, the romanticism around it through, through pop culture. I know the AFL tried it with that, you know, making their mark thing, which frankly, I, I was not a big fan of. I thought it was pretty big. I, ha I hated uh, the last episode. Missed opportunity. I, to be honest, <laughs> I hated it all. But I, it was all just like middle distance pontification and like scenery, you know, panning scenery shots. I, I didn't think it really captured the stories at all. And I didn't think it really yeah. well, I, showed much um, of anything. It, I was, I was just, yeah. anyway. I was just I, more I disappointed about the second half with Richmond. Um. <laughs> yeah. Well, as a, you know, again, 2017 is still right, large right. in my mind. So I can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But it, but it does seem like that's the kind of thing that, mm -hmm. that needs to be done. Yeah. Even well. if, if that one example wasn't a good one, mm -hmm. right? You've got to find ways to to yeah. expose people, and and you know if they're if they're not watching you know, the game, I I've I've you know I, I know I touted and I, I've tossed out the idea that that I think that that FS1 FS2 if they had some yeah you know, because during this during our summer months here there's not a lot of live sports that they're necessarily covering. Uh, during the course of the day, we're getting a lot of replay of, you know, the best MMA knockouts and, you know, 27 year old poker, poker events and that sort of thing on there that I've, I've, I've often said, what about say at, you know, 11 PM 
on a Wednesday night or on a Thursday night or whatever, spend a half an hour or an hour covering the highlights of the previous week's AFL games. And then, you know, mention here are the four or five games that we're going to be covering this weekend. I, I, you know, again, I know that again, you have to have the advertisers wanting to invest in putting that program on there, but I, I think it's almost a, it almost becomes a, a, um, what the, what are the perpetual motion machines kind of a thing? I think there that, you know, that I don't, I don't know what those are called, but you know, yeah, yeah something like that where it just, you know, it just keeps on going where this is, this is going to help to build this other thing, which will then help to build this, which will, and it just continues to feed off of itself. I think it would just be, a, uh, but I don't think anybody has had the inkling to, to, to make that leap to do that yet. I understand there's obviously an expense, you know, and, and cost, and there's got to be justify the investment. But I mean, what about having American commentators talking over the top of the feed? And, and you right, don't have right. to be live, right? Like if you're, if you're a casual fan, you're not, you know, you're not going to be following the results like on a daily basis. It, you know, in Australia, we used to always get the Formula One races delayed to, you know, late at night. Um, because that's when they decided to show up and there's no other way of finding out. Now, in this day and age of social media, people can follow it. But again, if you're not a dedicated hardcore fan, you're probably not watching the results as they roll in on social media. And so showing a game that's not live, you know, a couple of times a week or, you know, even preceding, you know, the, the live game, mm-hmm. show one from the last week and have a special where you have a couple of American commentators or American Australian commentators talking through that, that can help kind of explain what it is and explain the, the game because it is a, a technical, confusing game. I got into NFL because I was watching it with some mm-hmm. friends in the Midwest who mm-hmm. love the game and love sharing it. My wife is a big NFL fan. So we watch the game. She explained the rules and explained the flags and, and the penalties and those sorts of things. Um, you know, show one game a week where it is a replay, but with American commentators explaining what's happening and why and when That's- and what, why it matters rather than just having like, you know, BT screaming his head off about, you know, grabbing the pill, which, you know, even just a colloquialism, that Americans are going to understand all the colloquialisms <laughs> in Australian, um, you know, commentary. Yeah, and I think, I think, you know, another approach is to play up that American connection. You know, so the, the why is Mason Cox not Good a question. star in the U.S.? Why does yeah. no one know who he is? Right? He should have a huge well, amount of social admit, media following. I, I have not reached out to him to get him on the podcast and I and I need to. I've not done it yet. I mean, I've 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 started to scratch the surface of, of getting some people who were involved directly with the game. Um about six months into the podcast, and uh, you know. John, you'll, this name will probably resonate more with you than with Seth, but I, I reached out to Ricky Nixon and had, had Ricky Nixon on the podcast, and he had no idea who the hell I was. And it, to me, it, it is still my favorite interview I ever did because Ricky Nixon had a bit of a reputation that had preceded him. There are a lot of things that had gone on during his playing career and such, and then he went on to become basically the Jerry Maguire of the AFL in terms of being, you know, kind of like the, the first super agent for the players and help the players earn a lot more money. Well, when I reached out to him, I'm sure he thought, you know, cause I'd seen several interviews where people had asked him all those uncomfortable questions. And I said, I said to myself, I'm not even going to talk about those things. And, you know, when I finished and I, he said, well, I can give you a half an hour. And it was like seven o'clock in the morning, his time. And I, uh, you know, I asked him about all sorts of things in terms of his career, his, uh, um, in, in, as an agent, uh, the business that he runs right now did, you know, the fact that he'd been a school teacher at one time. And he told me after the fact that I've never had anybody ask me questions like that before. And, you know, and I actually, I, I, I put up a, a post up on Facebook the other day, uh, that, that he commented on, cause I'll, I'll, I don't trade a lot of messages with him, but he's somebody that I've, I've stayed in touch with. You know, I, I interviewed the, the new D's president, uh back in may you know i've had uh you know a couple of former players you know that that played back in the 60s and 70s with the with the ruse and with the d's um you know so it well even even i mean like i god forbid i say anything complimentary about the targets but i mean you know they're they're, they're being run by an expat american where, where right, is that right. connection 
come back? Where is that 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 feeding that back to the U.S. Uh, in some ways? So you know, there, there are a lot of connections there, and I mean, there's a lot of um, AFL players over here, you know, playing mm-hmm. in the NFL. Um, so there's a lot to talk to them. I mean, um, Sav Rocker came out to a couple of Eagles games, I think, uh, back when he was playing for the, for Washington. Um, you know, th- again, we need a strategy where we reach out to these people. And the other thing is, a lot of the AFL players are huge right, American right. sports fans, right? Like, you know, American no. sports has really grown exponentially in the US in the last couple of years. And, I, and there's, there's a number of reasons of that that I can hypothesize about, you know, and go down that rabbit hole. Um, but I mean, one of them has been that American sports mm-hmm. have been actually shown on TV. Again, accessibility, yeah. people can actually watch it. Um, when, when I left 10 years ago, they were starting to show them um, over there. And I would have watched them when I was a kid, but I didn't right. see them because they weren't shown. Um, they're starting to be, and you see growth of NFL in America because there is now the ability to watch it and to follow it and to track it because of social media. So, you know, where is the, the engagement with mm-hmm. the AFL players who love American sports who can come and help share their love for both sports yeah. together over here. Um, you know, I think there's a, there's a lot of avenues, but again, it, it needs a more comprehensive thinking of a strategy, not just like AFL saying, well, if we show a game, are we going to get a return in advertising dollars? That's, that's not a strategy. That's just a, that's just a, a hail Mary to use yep. the American. Well, one of the, uh, one of the ones that, that I've seen on social media uh, that is a huge American sports fan is Tom Dude, who is, who's posting, mm-hmm. you know, a lot about, um, the NBA about the NFL, that sort of thing. And it just, and he, he just seems to be just, a, you know, a, t- a terrific young man. And I, I think he's going to, I think he's going to be a captain of the Crows oh, he, here I, in the very near future. Absolutely. I'd be very surprised if it's not next year. And, and, and he is, I mean, he is just a stellar personality. I mean, you know, clubs talk about, mm-hmm. you know, good characters and, and culture and all those sorts of things. I mean, that guy exemplifies everything about it. I, he seems like, uh, it seems a little good to be true in some ways. He just seems like such a great guy, but, um, yeah, I mean, he was in D.C. a couple of years ago uh, to, to watch some of the games. Um, his knowledge of the NFL and the college is amazing. I remember a couple of years ago, I, I interacted with him on, on Twitter and, and he had an NFL draft of who was going to pick who. And he put uh, he predicted the Packers picking Jordan Love as quarterback. And I said to him, that's <laughs> nuts. Why would you, why, would, you know, why on earth would you have a quarterback going there? They need a receiver. They've got Aaron Rodgers. And he said, the guys just got too much talent to mm-hmm. slide out of the first round. The Packers will take Lo and it. behold, and yeah, they did. I mean, his knowledge of, of, of us sports is, is, you know, probably some of the best in Australia. Okay. So final question I have for you gentlemen, and this is, this is, you know, we're still a couple months away, but before the start, who's playing in the men's grand final this year. That's a tough one. Uh, I don't think Geelong is going to make it there. Um, I think, you know, I, I think the, the window is closed there and, and they're going to fall off a cliff. I think West Coast is going to fall off a demographic cliff or have for about to, you know, are in the process of falling off demographic cliff. Um, have GWS bolstered them themselves enough to get up that next little bit? I don't know. Port Adelaide are just too unreliable and, and my my hometown tendency is you know, <laughs> going to pump them up. But, you know, his, history has shown they'll, they'll probably... Yeah, they, you know, they'll get into September, but but again, have they bolstered, have they done enough just to tip them over to get to the next level? I don't know. Um, but I mean, the D shows that, you know, like who took them seriously at the start of the year? I mean, we, we've seen the, the signs there, um, but, you know, we couldn't really rely upon them and they just, just everything clicked in that way. I think there's a couple of things where it could, it could be, you know, it could be GWS, it could be Port that just it clicks this year round and, and they go for it. Um, Bulldogs, I think, are going are, are to be pretty irresistible. But, um, you know, again, history has shown in the last couple of years that when teams almost make it and get to the, the grand final, then they, they tend to fall over a couple of years after. I think they, their list is young enough that they're not going to do that. There's enough talent there. Uh, but I don't know if they can, they can push up again. Um, I think the, the competition might be the open that's been, the most open it's been in the last, you know, for the last four or five years. I think, I think we're about to go through a shift where the new tactics or a new approach to the game is a new concept's going to come in. And no one's quite sure what that's going to be. I don't, don't think the Swans are going to be there just yet. I, I, the big question is going to be, is Essendon going to break its drought and actually win a finals for the first time in 1,000 days or whatever it is? I, I don't have, sorry, Seth, I don't have faith that, that St. Kilda's list build is, is solid enough. I think they're going to push into the eight and then fall down again. Um, yeah, Carlton, I, I would agree with that. Uh, I, I don't know. It, it could be a crap show. I think Melbourne's going to be hard to beat, but, but it, you know, going back to yeah. back is very difficult. I think, Bulldogs are going to be there or thereabouts, but um, how about you, Seth? 
I, I, I tend to agree with you, John, that I think it's going to be a very open competition. It's going to be hard to pick. And, and, and yeah, I think we are starting to see a, a shift in tactics. And so, you know, with that, it may not come down to who's got the best list, but who's got the best coaching staff, you know, and, you know, when you, when you look at someone like, like Melbourne, you know, having, having that success and, and knowing that everyone is going to buy in a hundred percent to whatever mm-hmm. you're selling makes a big difference. And so I think they're, they're going to be tough to beat this. You know, when I was younger. I really, um, I didn't really believe in the, the, the mental psychology and the sports psychology, having an army background, like, you know, I was always kind of a, you know, you have a job, go out and do it type of thing. And I, I never really believed, I ever thought all the kind of like, you know, the culture and the, the psychology and the belief and all that always, always felt like, you know, um, kumbaya, hold hands and hug each other type stuff. And I didn't really think that had a tangible impact. The older I've got, the more I, I believe that genuinely that, that intangible of something like belief is really the most important, powerful force and, and the psychology of it. I've seen, you know, with a, uh, you know, started to dabble in the junior side of, of sports. Um, I, and I'll give an example from Zoe's last race. You know, she'd had a really tough back half of the season and hadn't got the results we we're looking for. And we were, we were back at the track that was closest to us and some of her friends were coming down the race there the first time. And I kind of jokingly said to her, like, you know, this is your house, you defend your house. And I, I, I was just kind of doing it as, as kind of a silly throwaway rah-rah type thing. But she repeated that maxim. She got it wrong. She kept saying this is our hometown. But she kept saying it all the way through the weekend. And, and that seemed to be a genuine, like, focal point that her energy went into. Is This is my house. I'm going to defend my house. I'm going to go out and, and, and race hard. Some of those sorts of things that I've always kind of been fairly cynical about and always thought, you know, didn't have a real impact. I mean, they, they really do. And, and particularly that psychology of sport, keeping kids interested and focused and energized and those sorts of things. I mean, I've seen with, you know, with, with this getting into, into coaching the AFL stuff, the skill stuff, I, I, I'm really shocked and amazed at how quickly I've picked it up. I mean, you know, you, you saw the video that I put up and I just grabbed some GoPro and some, some camera footage of them kicking around, but, you know, these are, you know, it's a, it's a hard technical sport, punting a ball, dropping it down, getting the ball mm-hmm. drop right. Um, I grew up with it cradle to grave and I still do it badly. Um, and, and for me, it's more of an instinct. And the interesting thing is I think um, some of the, the, the American players like Seth who have come to it later have much better technique than I do because they've learned the technical thing. Whereas I just learned to just drop the ball and throw it on your foot and kick it around the backyard and, and around the sports yard. And so I, I picked up a lot of bad habits where some of the, American players have learned the technical way of doing it and do it much better. But I, I you know, really worried about how do you teach kids something that difficult, that challenging to do that, that outside of their norm. I knew it because I saw it and it was, it was ingrained into my circuitry. How do you teach a six-year-old to, to handball in a way they've never seen before? But I can't believe how quickly they picked it up. And if you look at that video, you know, that could be any right. school in Australia. Um, the, the skills were not that that far different. And all they had was four one hour, one and a half hour sessions over, over a summer and then nothing for 11 months. And yet the quality of that, and there was a couple of chains that you can see in this. There was, there was a young girl who um, had never played the game before, but I, I understand from her dad that she'd watched some YouTube videos before she came to the session. And there was one where she like, she went up in the rock and she just tapped it directly into the arms of the other player. It was just the most perfect mm-hmm. tap work I've seen from a kid who, who'd never done it before. Um, there was a there was another series in that in that video um, where there was three or four handball. There was a chain of handballs down the field, and to see that was just for me was incredible. I mean, it was just so rewarding to see these kids, these American kids who had no exposure to it, never seen the game before, never been taught the skills before, and just suddenly with a couple of training sessions were able to do it. So my you know my final take home is take the kids out and do it. Do it with a do it with a soccer ball. Not a basketball because it's too heavy, but it's you know twenty bucks to buy an AFL ball off the play play footy uh, website. I can't remember the exact name is it playfooty.com. Uh, I think play, or, play Aussie playaussie.com. You know it's, it's twenty bucks right. to get a synthetic ball, and I you know I, I took my kids out to to the you know the Eagles thing to try that out, um, but we just kick it around the in the in the the house you know down in the much of my wife's uh, frustration. Just kick it around the, in the downstairs area or in the you know in yeah. the backyard, and it's amazing how quickly they pick it up. The other one I I did was, you know, you, you heard Zoe. She loves the, the the physical side of it. She loves the, the hip and shoulders, but she really loved um, at, at the at the uh, Eagles Oz kick sessions. Every week we have a, we have a different themes. So we have a handball, and we have a kick, 
for one week we do marking and we end that with a marks up thing where the, the coaches hold uh-huh. a, a punching bag right, or, right. you know like a training bag a boxing bag and the kids run up and they jump into it and catch the ball or grab it out of her hands that's what zoe loved the most and so that's what i did was she enjoyed that the most the first time around the first session so i went and bought an mma pad off amazon for 30 bucks or something and i did that i, I held the mma pad and i hold the football above it and she runs up and she jumps up and grabs it and that's where that's what she enjoyed and that drove the passion into the other skills and the other activities and wanted to do it. So find the different aspects of the game that, that your kids enjoy and then, you know, kind of delve into that. Um, but just get them out and playing because it's amazing how quickly they pick it up Fantastic. and how much they enjoy it. Yeah, just to, just to follow on that, you know, I was working mostly with the older kids uh, at, at the sessions this year. And, you know, when we would start playing games with them, not only the, the link up handballs, but but the 360 mm-hmm. aspect of the game, right? They're they're you know they get they get trapped. Right? I'll pass behind, and we can't train <laughs> the adults to do that, right? It 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 is for Americans, right? For the the sports we play, everything yeah. is straight ahead, straight ahead, straight ahead, and to get them to understand that is is a real challenge, right? We're we still work on that almost every week at, at Eagles training, yeah. and these kids just pick it up naturally. They just figure it out. And so, you know, the, the, the earlier we can get them into this, the better Fantastic. they're going to be. And also, John, I, I really want to thank you because honestly, no one has ever complimented my <laughs> technique before. Thank you for that. Compared to mine, it's brilliant. Um, yeah, I mean, I was never a very good player. Um, I wasn't particularly athletic. I wasn't particularly skilled. The one thing I could do is I'm big and I could hit hard. So that's kind of what I relied on in my game was, that's probably why I had to retire. I was going to get getting injured from, from hitting things too hard. All right, guys. I, I appreciate you. Uh, you know, this is a, a good chunk of time that you guys set aside this morning and this afternoon. Now I do want to thank you for that. I'd like to thank uh, Seth Sternberg and John Watts and Zoe, who's off tackling somebody somewhere um, or driving around the neighborhood, possibly unbeknownst to dad uh, for stopping by the podcast today. This was a, a huge amount of insight in terms of what you guys are doing uh, with, you know, trying to develop the game with, with younger people and get them interested in it. I truly appreciate you guys taking time out of your day to sit down and talk with me. I know this has been a couple of months that we've been trying to get this set up and I'm so glad we were able to do it. And I hope that uh, this summer coming up, you, you have a successful um, set of training sessions with, with the young people and get them more and more interested. And in, in, in it was just an absolute joy to talk to both of you today. Thanks, Greg. Really appreciate the opportunity. You bet. Yeah. You bet, Seth. Thanks so very much, guys. Cheers. All right. Cheers. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed that episode uh, focusing in on the DC Eagles. Don't forget that you can reach me over at my website, Yank. Uh, yankonthefooty.com, but also by email at yankonthefooty at gmail.com, as well as on Twitter at yank underscore on, and Instagram and Facebook at yankonthefooty. If you haven't done so already, I hope you'll head over to my uh, website, get on the mailing list, so when a new episode comes out, it comes to you almost instantaneously. You can also find you know all of my episodes over there. And also, as far as the mailing list, when I do put out a live episode or I'm going to be having a live episode, which we're going to be starting up again here very soon, I will send out notifications to the people on my mailing list. And again, I'm not I'm not bombarding you with all kinds of offers or anything like that. It's just simply when a new episode comes out, so you've got it, so you can check it out right away. So if you want to get signed up, that'd be fantastic. Now, everybody, I want to thank you for listening. We're fans of different clubs. The women's season, the women's comp is about halfway done. We have... One undefeated club remaining. I'll have an episode out this week uh, talking about uh, round five. Again, this is the greatest game on the planet, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you so much for sharing it with me. I thank you so much for sharing of your time. Remember, if you check the show notes, if you've got a, uh, a sticker for your club that you've got laying around in a desk drawer or something of that nature that you'd want to share with me, I would be delighted to display that in my classroom on my desk. You can find my mailing address in the show notes for this episode. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I hope you'll consider sharing the episode with your friends and family. As always, may your dribble kick never hit the post. I will catch you later. This has been episode 125 of Yank on the Footy. Don't forget that you can reach me at yank underscore on on Twitter or to yank on the footy at gmail.com. Also on Instagram and Facebook at a yank on the footy. And be sure to check out my website at yankonthefooty.com. And ladies and gentlemen, until next time, this is Craig Wessels and goodbye. <laughs>